So the last step is important generally for all uh, information that you collect, but it's also specifically important for COPPA. And so COPPA requires you to implement reasonable procedures to protect the security of kids' information uh, after you collect it. And so the requirement is that you establish and maintain reasonable procedures to protect the confidentiality of collected information, as well as its security and integrity. Uh, the FCT, FTC suggests a lot of ways as to how to accomplish this. Uh, before I get into those bullet points, I want to take, keep in mind that this isn't necessarily a uh, data security, cybersecurity style course, so we won't necessarily get into a lot of the implementation measures. But I would like to, in upcoming videos, give you at least some suggestions as to how to do things like... Uh, secure data and uh, generally when you when you run a mobile app or you have a website that you're building and just best practices like knowing where your plugins are coming from when you're using WordPress etc but without further ado here are the bullet points uh, minimize what you collect in the first place so if you don't if you only take the information that you use then of course uh, there's not as much risk that information will be lost if you have a small amount of information. Uh, and this sort of goes against everything that you might be being told by the people who are in charge of marketing the website or app because uh, the big thing now is growth hacking and sort of paying attention to a lot of deep and big data. And so uh, oftentimes everyone else in a company will want uh, you to collect as much data as possible and then legal counsel is probably going to be the only voice saying that we want to collect as little data as possible. Number two, take reasonable steps to release the personal information only as service providers and third parties capable of maintaining confidentiality, security, and integrity. So pretty much just know who you're working with in a lot of ways. I mean, if you don't trust the practices of other people you might be giving the data to, or if it's some sort of individual contractor who doesn't have any sort of security on their system or who's haphazardly sort of keeping your data on, uh, on external hard drives that they don't really keep track of or anything like that, then maybe you want to have a discussion with these people before you allow them to take the personal information, copies of the personal information that you collected. Uh, just doing your due diligence on any uh, service providers that you're working with to ensure what are your levels of security that you take when we give you data. How do you use data? Do you sell it to anyone else? And so just seeing those things uh, at face value and asking those generalized questions uh, and knowing where you draw your line at the risk that you're taking when working with any of these people is probably a good thing to do with any, any data, not just to comply with COPPA. Get assurances that the third parties will live up to those responsibilities. And so this can happen in any, any manner of ways. You can get oral assurances. You can have them sign off on contract provisions saying that uh, they'll treat the data in certain ways. You can get them to sign a contract that says uh, makes a minimum requirement for data security and safety. So, so there's all sorts of ways you can get assurances, some of them formal, some of them informal. And again, it's all about the risk that you perceive. Hold on to personal information only as long as it's reasonably necessary for the pr purpose for which it was collected. And so, assuming that you don't really have that much experience working with uh, uh, websites and big development projects or apps or things like that, you might say, oh, that sounds like common sense. We'll only hold on to the personal information as long as it's reasonably necessary. But that flies completely in the face of being able to track results over time. Uh, it flies in the face of being able to retain 
uh, users, and even if they're inactive users, uh, getting them back to activity by contacting them through their personal information or restoring their accounts or things like that. And so it might seem very simple at face value to only hold as much information as long as you need it, but it's a good way to stifle your business if you take that uh, to its take that completely at face value. And so, again, you have to manage your risk and look at your actual situation and see whether or not this makes sense for you. Securely dispose of the information once you no longer have a legitimate reason for retaining it. And so some organizations, some app companies, some individual developers keep their information forever. That's, that's often a good idea. You have your archives. You can look up things if you ever get audited for tax purposes. But at the same time, uh, bigger companies have data, uh, data deletion policies. Let's say that every three months all of your emails are deleted uh, and they have policies based on shredding documentation and things like that. And so these companies often use these policies to stay out of trouble, to get rid of evidence <laughs> in certain respects, because if you have a, uh, a data deletion policy and something gets deleted that's inappropriate and something that might cause you problems, well, then you won't get in trouble for deleting it if it's part of the policy. Uh, again, general information. But overall, uh, again, it's one of those things at face value that it's actually hard to enforce, and it's practically really difficult to uh, dispose of information because you lose so much. And oftentimes, you always have a legitimate reason for keeping certain types of personal information that you've collected. So what you should come away with is that... Uh, at the end of the day, maintaining these reasonable security measures all involves asking a lot of questions and doing a lot of risk assessment and weighing uh, the the burden, administrative burden of keeping people's information safe with the uh, benefits of complying with COPPA as well as more generally complying with all of the other information security uh, laws. And at the end of the day, um, and I have a cybersecurity course for beginners, if you want to learn about this in more detail, uh, it's, uh, you can, it's very, very cheap to secure data in comparison with how expensive it is if you suffer a breach. And so even though data breaches are sometimes, uh, not a huge risk for certain types of companies doing certain types of things. Uh, they are always a risk for anyone doing uh, work on the internet, anyone doing the type of work where more than one person has access to data and can misappropriate it. And so the cost of a data breach is so much more expensive than the cost of just securing in the first place. Uh, and by cost, I mean both economic costs, costs for public relations and losing customers, uh, cost for all of the legal hassles and the legal expense it takes to uh, survive a data breach, and the IT cost of then upgrading your systems and changing your strategy so it doesn't happen again. So if you have those strategies and good strategies in place ahead of time, and and at for, at the beginning of your operation, you won't have any costs of changing it later on. All right, I'm rambling, but I think that you get the point. And in the next videos, hopefully, we will bring this together with specific examples from uh, websites that are doing a good job complying with COPPA and show you some best practices uh, to synthesize all of these suggestions from the FTC as well as these requirements from COPPA into something that you can use for your own uh, website or app.